Chapter 3 Preserving a Religious Vocation He then, who wishes to be faithful to the divine call, ought not only to resolve to follow it, but to follow it promptly, if he does not wish to expose himself to the evident danger of losing his vocation. And in case he should by necessity be forced to wait, he ought to use all diligence to preserve it, as the most precious jewel he could have. The means to preserve vocation are three in number, secrecy, prayer, and recollection. Section 1. Secrecy. First, generally speaking, he must keep his vocation secret from everybody except his spiritual father, because commonly the men of the world scruple not to say to young men who are called to the religious state that one may serve God everywhere and therefore in the world also. And it is wonderful that such propositions come sometimes out of the mouth of priests and even of religious, but of such religious only as have either become so without vocation or to not know what vocation is. Yes, without doubt, he who is not called to the religious state may serve God in every place, but not he who is called to it, and then from his own inclination wishes to remain in the world. Such a one, as I have said above, can with difficulty serve God and lead a good life. It is especially necessary to keep the vocation secret from parents. It was indeed the opinion of Luther, as Bellarmine relates, that children entering religion without the consent of their parents commit a sin. For, said he, children are bound to obey their parents in all things. But this opinion has generally been rejected by councils and the Holy Fathers. The Tenth Council of Toledo expressly says, It is lawful for children to become religious without the consent of their parents, provided they have attained the age of puberty. These are the words. It shall not be lawful for parents to put their children in a religious order after they shall have attained their fourteenth year. After this age, it shall be lawful for children to take upon themselves the yoke of religious observance, whether it be with the consent of their parents or only the wish of their own hearts. The same is prescribed in the Council of Trevor and is taught by St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. Bernard, St. Thomas, and others, with St. John Chrysostom, who writes in general, When parents stand in the way in spiritual things, they ought not even to be recognized. Some doctors say that when a child called by God to the religious state could easily and securely obtain the consent of his parents without any danger on their part of hindering him from following his vocation, it is becoming that he should seek to obtain their blessing. This doctrine could be held speculatively, but not so in practice, because in practice such a danger always exists. It will be well to discuss this point fully in order to do away with certain pharisaical scruples which some entertain. It is certain that in the choice of a state of life children are not bound to obey parents. Thus the doctors with common accord teach with St. Thomas, who says, Servants are not bound to obey their masters, nor children their parents with regard to contradicting matrimony, preserving virginity, and such like things. Nevertheless, with regard to the state of marriage, Father Penamonte, in his treatise on religious vocation, is justly of the opinion of Sanchez, Koning, and others who hold that a child is bound to take counsel of his parents because in such matters they may have more experience than the young. But speaking, then, of religious vocation, the above-mentioned Penamonte wisely adds that a child is not bound at all to take counsel of his parents because in this matter they have no experience and through interest are commonly changed into enemies. As St. Thomas also remarks, when speaking of religious vocation, frequently, he says, our friends, according to the flesh, are opposed to our spiritual good. For fathers often prefer that their children should be damned with themselves rather than be saved away. Hence, St. Bernard exclaims, O hard father, O cruel mother, whose consolation is the death of their son, who wish rather 
that we perish with them than reign without them. God says a grave author quoted by St. Thomas, when he calls one to a perfect life, wishes him to forget his father, saying, Hearken, O daughter, and see, and incline thy ear, and forget thy people and thy father's house. Psalms 44.11 By this, then, he adds, the Lord certainly admonishes us that he who is called ought by no means to allow the counsel of parents to intervene. If God will have a soul who is called by him forget his father in his father's house, without doubt he suggests by this that he who is called to the religious state ought not, before he follows the call, to interpose the counsel of the carnal friends of his household. St. Cyril, explaining that Jesus Christ said to the youth mentioned above, No man, putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9.62 Comments on it and says that he who asks for time to confer with his parents in reference to his vocation is exactly the one who is declared by our Lord to be unfit for heaven. In order to confer with his parents, he looks back who seeks for delay. Hence, St. Thomas absolutely advises those who are called to religion to abstain from deliberating on their vocation with their relatives. From this deliberation, the relatives of the flesh are before all to be excluded. For it is said, Treat thy cause with thy friend, Proverbs 25, 9. But the relatives of the flesh are in this affair not our friends, but our enemies, according to the saying of our Lord. A man's enemies shall be they of his household. Matthew 10.36 if, then, for following one's vocation, it would be a great error to ask the counsel of parents, it would be a greater one still to ask their permission and to wait for it. For such a demand cannot be made without an evident danger of losing the vocation, as often as there is a probable fear that parents would exert themselves to prevent it. And, in fact, the saints, when they were called to leave the world, left their homes without giving their parents so much as an intimation of it. Thus acted a St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Francis Xavier, a St. Philip Neri, St. Louis Bertrand, and we know that the Lord has, even by miracles, approved of such glorious flights. St. Peter of Alcantara, when he went to the monastery to become a religious and was fleeing from the house of his mother, under whose obedience he had lived since the death of his father, found himself prevented by a wide river from advancing any further. He recommended himself to God and at the same instant saw himself transported to the other side. Likewise, when St. Stanislas Kaska fled from home without the permission of his father, his brother set out after him in great haste in a carriage. But having almost overtaken him, the horses, in spite of all the violence used against them, would not advance a step further till turning towards the city they began to run at full speed. In like manner, the blessed Oringa of Waldrano, in Tuscany, being promised in marriage to a young man, fled from the house of her parents in order to consecrate herself to God. But the river Arno, opposing itself to her course, after a short prayer, she saw it divide and form, as it were, two walls of crystal to let her pass through with dry feet. Therefore, my beloved brother, if you are called by God to leave the world, be very careful not to make your resolution known to your parents, and, content to be thus blessed by God, seek to execute it as promptly as you can, and without their knowledge, if you would not expose yourself to a great danger of losing your vocation. For, generally speaking, relatives, as was said above, especially fathers and mothers, oppose the execution of such resolutions. And although they may be endowed with piety, interest and passion nevertheless render them so blind that under various pretexts they scruple not to thwart with all their might the vocation of their children. We read in the life of Father Paul Signeri, the younger, that his mother, though a matron much given to prayer, left, Nevertheless, no means untried to prevent her son from entering the religious state to which he was called. 
We also read in the life of Monsignor Cavalleri, Bishop of Trojo, that his father, although a man of great piety, used every means to prevent his son from entering the congregation of pious workmen, which, notwithstanding, he afterwards did, and even went so far as to bring against him a lawsuit in the ecclesiastical court. And how many other fathers, although they are men of piety and prayer, have not in such cases been seen to change and to become possessed, as it were, of the devil? For hell, it seems, arms itself so much for no other thing than to prevent those who are called to the religious state from executing their resolution. For this reason, be also very careful not to communicate your design to your friends, who will not scruple to dissuade you from it, or at least divulge the secret, so that the knowledge of it will easily come to the ears of your parents. Section 2. Prayer In the second place, it is necessary to know that these vocations are only preserved by prayer. He who gives up prayer will certainly give up his vocation. It is necessary to pray, and to pray much, and therefore let him who feels himself called not omit to make every morning after rising mental prayer of an hour, or at least of half an hour, in his own room, if he can do so there without molestation, and if not, in the church, and likewise of half an hour in the evening. Let him not neglect also to make every day without fail a visit to the Most Holy Sacrament, and also to the Most Blessed Virgin Mary, in order to obtain the grace of perseverance in his vocation. Let him likewise not omit to receive Holy Communion thrice, or at least twice a week. His meditations should almost always be on this point of the vocation, considering how great a favor from God he has received in being thus called by him. How much more easily he will secure his eternal salvation if he be faithful to God in following his vocation, and, on the contrary, to how great a danger of being damned he exposes himself if he be unfaithful. Let him then especially place before his eyes the hour of death and consider the contentment he will then feel if he shall have obeyed God, and the pains and the remorse he would experience if he should die in the world. To this end, I shall add, at the end of this little work, some considerations on which he may make his mental prayer. It is moreover necessary that all his prayers to Jesus and Mary, and especially those after communion and in the visits, have for their object to obtain perseverance. In all his prayers and communions, let him always renew the offering of himself to God by saying, Behold, O Lord. I am no more mine, I am thine. Already have I given myself to thee, and now I renew this, my offering, of my whole self. Accept of me, and give me strength to be faithful to thee, and to retire as quickly as possible into thy holy house. Section 3. Recollection In the third place, it is necessary that he be recollected. This will not be possible for him unless he withdraws from worldly conversations and amusements. What, in short, as long as we are in the world, is sufficient to cause the loss of vocation, a mere nothing. One day of amusement, a word from a friend, a passion that we do not mortify, a little attachment, a thought of fear, or a resentment we do not overcome, suffices to bring to naught all our resolutions of retiring from the world or of giving ourselves entirely to God. Wherefore, we ought to keep perfectly recollected, detaching ourselves from everything of this world. We should, during this time, think of nothing but prayer and frequenting the sacraments, and to be nowhere but at home and in the church. Let him who will not do so, but distracts himself by pastimes, be persuaded that he will, without doubt, lose his vocation. He will remain with the remorse of not having followed it. But he certainly will not follow it. Oh, how many, by neglecting these precautions, 
have lost first their vocation and afterwards their souls. End of chapter 3